Well, my name is Alex Anderson Edmondson. Okay. I'm a lifelong resident of Wilson, North Carolina. Uh, I made my entrance into Wilson County in the year 1953. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 53, where did right. you come from? Um, my parents were James and O.C. Anderson. And as a matter of fact, my father, James Anderson, was a World War II veteran and he was a custodian of janitor, as they called it back in the day, for uh, the Wilson County of Wilson at the courthouse. He was janitor there for over 35 years. That was your father? Mm -hmm. My father. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yep. Oh, and what was his name again? James Arthur Anderson. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was a uh, janitor there for over 35 years. Five years. And I remember as a little girl going to see him on the job sometimes. Uh, I remember their signs colored and white only. And even as a child, we were still not allowed. Even that was his job as a child. My sister and I were still not allowed to drink from that fountain or use the bathroom. Even though my daddy was responsible for cleaning both bathrooms, we were not allowed to go to the white fountain and drink from the white fountain or use the white bathroom. Um, there was a monument outside. I don't know whether they told me about that. The bus stop used to be there was a white section for the, to sit in and a black section to sit in, or color as they called it back in the day. Um, where I came from was Nash Street. That was my home originally. We moved from Pender Street to Nash Street. And at that time, Nash Street was a business hub for the black citizens. There was a drugstore. Uh, Shay's Drugstore, there was the Ritz Theater, uh, the Orange Motel, we stayed right beside the Orange Motel, there was Dodge Robinson's Beauty Shop, and there was Hamilton's Funeral Home right beside the Beauty Shop, because I remember as a child, my sister, uh, Marilyn, uh, my cousin, Lizzie, and one the only other girl that lived in the neighborhood, uh, Nellie, she was the niece of uh, B.T. Barnes, we used to run over to the funeral home and play in the coffins. <laughs> <laughs> there were the wooden ones that hadn't been covered, but we used to play hide and go seek in the coffins at Hamilton Funeral Home. So you weren't scared? No, no, you know, you weren't scared. They, they kept them stacked up on the back porch and whenever they needed them, you know, they would cover them with the felt, the gray felt to make them look, but they were yeah. basically boxes, wooden boxes like you used to see in the old west. Okay. And those were the places we used to go and play hide and seek. Because at the time, we were the only four girls living on Nash Street. Only four girls, no guys, just four yeah. girls. Uh, across the street from us, uh, we lived at 528 East Nash Street. That was the address. Uh -huh. Across the street from us, there was the Wigorama. This Lillian artist on that. Uh, she, it was high fashion hats, gloves, because that was the, the, the stuff to wear back in the day. Uh, there was Artist's Barbershop with a man, SP Artist. He owned the barbershop. As a matter of fact, his wife is still living. Mm -hmm. um, there was the red front grill on the corner, and there was a stoplight grill around the corner because the library was right beside the stoplight grill. Miss Mason, she had a stoplight grill. Red front had the best hot dogs in the world. There was uh, Mr. Rose, Dr. Rose, the dentist. His office was directly above the drugstore. Uh -huh. Uh, movies back then for us that were really cheap. You know, 25 cents, we can go see a good cowboy movie and have money left over for popcorn and so <laughs> um, There was not. So, was there a, 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 a movie theater right there on? Right Street? across the street. Mm -hmm. right. We, we, like cool. I said, we were, there, there were only two houses, residential houses, on that street. That was the house we lived in. That was the 520 East Nash. Yeah. And then four houses down. Miss B.T. Barnes lived. She was a teacher. She taught at it was Elvis Street School at the time, but she was a teacher uh -huh. at Elvis Street School. She taught fourth grade. And um, her niece lived with her, and the Clays lived beside the funeral home, and then we lived between the funeral home and Doris's beauty shop. But across the street from us and right beside us, there was the Orange Hotel. Miss mm -hmm. Coleman, Maggie Coleman on that hotel. Um, you know, when people would come in, they needed a place to stay. That's where they lived, and eventually it became a rumor house. Uh, across the street from us, like I said, there was the Wigorama. That was a high fashion boutique in the barbershop. There was Libby's Cafe. She cooked uh, smoked barbecue the old-fashioned way. She had a pit in the back of the 
barbecue place. And right. they would smoke pigs in the back of that, that place and cook their fresh barbecue. Mm -hmm. Right beside her was um, Lucille's Beauty Shop. You can go and get your hair washed and straightened and get nice styles. It was owned by Rosa Arrington. And she was a deaconess at our church. She, as a matter of fact, she was one of the oldest deaconess at the time in her 90s when well, I was a child. Was, did you, was your church Jackson Chapel? My church was Jackson Chapel. Uh, we lived right down the street from Jackson Chapel. Uh, I came when DK's grandfather was pastor. I was a baby. And then by the time I got to maybe second or third grade, that's when Reverend Watkins came. Uh, maybe, I was maybe five, six at the time, six at the time, he came when I was six years old and my sister was four, because I remember joining, I've been a member at Jackson Chapel over 50 years. Are you still a member? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Still a member. Um, we used to have um, no play area, not no park, so we just would play on the porch and our house, the way it was built, they had a little balcony at the top, and across the street from us, uh, and with the high fashion, with a little, what you used to call juke joints, right. um, Mr. Zachary, Earl Zachary had a pool room across the street from us. We were not, the ladies were not allowed to go into the pool room. I don't, for, for nothing, not even to buy sodas, or that was just his, his thing. No girls, no ladies. You did not come into the pool room, even during the days when you know he was just opening and cleaning up. You must have wondered what was going on. Ah, uh, yeah, I would. We would ask, you know, and he would always say, you know, this is not a place for young girls. You know, ladies don't need to be in here. And, and he was a stickler for it. You know, you, you go and look in the window, and that's about as close as you got. Yeah. You didn't go in to shoot pool. You didn't go in to watch the men shoot pool. That was just taboo. Uh, on the other side of Miss. The bar shop. There was uh, Mr. Roger Bailey, and he had a television repair place. And you can go to his place, and you can see all the tubes, because <laughs> that's what they had in the television back then. Mm -hmm. All the little tubes that he was working on, and all the little televisions he had taken apart and tried to put back together. I mean, it was it was just a business area. Right. Just you can get anything you want. Um, there was Pete on Pettigrew Street around the corner. Pete Wells, he was white, but the majority of his clientele was black. As a matter of fact, he gave credit. You know, you can go and open up a credit account, and if mom or grandmama wanted something, they would send the child around to the corner to Pete's, and they'd tell them what they would want, um, a pound of flour, or some sugar, some chickens, and you know, he kept a book. What What's your his name? name? He was Pete. Pete Wells. Mm -hmm. Pete and Garland Wells. Mm -hmm. They own Pete, Pete on Pettigrew Street. That's the name, that was the name of the place. And uh, he was he extended credit. Um, like I said, you can go there, get whatever you needed. He kept a little book, a little diary, and, you know, with your name and your address and whatever you bought. At the end of the week, you go and sell up your account. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other corner from St. John and Calvary, on, Green, on the corner of Green and Pendle, mm -hmm. there was Mr. Mercer. He did the same thing, John Mercer. He was white. Mm -hmm. uh, businessman, but like I said, in that area there was majority African American, yeah. so he did the same thing. He, you go to his store and get whatever you needed as far as food and groceries are concerned. You go if you went during the week, and at the weekday he expected you to come in and sell your account. Mm -hmm. um, there was Terminal Drug Store across the track. That was our fun for the weekend. We got to go across the track to Terminal Drug Store and get some ice cream. Mm -hmm. um, Right by Terminal Drug Store, my grandmother's favorite place to shop was Star Furniture Company. And he had uh, all types of furniture and appliances and same thing. He, he was Jewish, but he had, you know, like I said, in that neighborhood, there were only African Americans and they were able to start a charge account. A lot of them, that was their first charge account. That was their first experience in buying something on time. Right. Because I remember my grandmother went, the first black and white television we got, mm -hmm. we got from Star Credit. And we got the little color screen. I don't remember where anybody remember that we used to have the color screen. Um, oh, that you put over that the, you black, put over and the black and white to make everything. Tonto would be yellow, <laughs> the uh, horse would be blue, uh, the long range would be green. <laughs> we, were, 
We thought we had arrived because we had color. <laughs> we had color. We thought, hey, you know, you can't touch us because we got color TV. You guys still have it black and white. But um, <laughs> that was the only place you could buy the silver Christmas trees. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The silver Christmas trees. And we didn't have the lights on the Christmas trees, so you can purchase the silver Christmas tree and yeah. little rotating lights with the different colors in it, and it will rotate and turn the Christmas tree blue or yellow or green. Um, we used to go shopping across, that's, that's, that's when we, wherever you cross Nash Street, you consider West Nash, right. from Terminal all the way back. There was a Piggy Wiggly where the bus station is now. And we used to shop at Piggy Wiggly. Yeah. Yes. Did um, white people shop there too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was a space yes, where that was a space people, and people could go. Yeah. And that, that was it. And there, there, there was another space further up behind the library, Win Dixon. But that was, I guess, after integration, shortly came in the what, 64, 65, then we were allowed to go to Win Dixon and shop. And so we would do that. But then there, and there was roses. If we wanted to go, that was a shopping excursion on Saturday morning. So we get up, um, mom would make a list of what she was getting for the grocery store. We'd go to Pedro Street and get that. Um, we would go across the tracks. Like I said, if we were real good and we behaved on the way home, we'd get an ice cream cone. Um, the post office was there where the museum is now. And J.C. Penney's Sears was on the other, across the street. I think there's a church there now. But that used to be serious. Huh. And we could shop there. We really could. Yeah. We could shop, buy dresses. You weren't allowed to try on the dresses. You, you go in and tell the clerk, well, my daughter needs a size four or a size five. And you know, if you saw the dress in that size, the clerk would give it to you. You, you were not allowed to try it on. I know you've heard this before, or maybe thought about it, but isn't that a tremendous irony that, um, that some black women were allowed to suckle white babies, mm -hmm. and yet my grandmother couldn't did. try on clothes. Mm -hmm. My grandmother What's did. up with that? I, I, I couldn't tell you. I, I, don't, I didn't think the milk was in, in the richer than, than what they had already had. <laughs> and we used, but my grandmother did that. for. Uh, yeah. She worked for Dr. William C. Hunter, mm -hmm. and he had three children, Betsy, Ted, and William. And that's what she did when she first got hired to work for them. That was one of the, that was one of her duties. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I would come home and say, you know, what? Well, I, I would ask her, well, why, why you, you know, why not the natural mother? And she would say, that's grown folks' business. Mm -hmm. And when you get older, you'll understand. Well, as I got older, I still couldn't understand. <laughs> to this day, I still don't understand. Uh, that's a make a bit of sense, especially considering that mm -hmm. you couldn't try on clothes. Right. I couldn't try on clothes. Hats. Mm -mm. Nope, no, nope. couldn't try on clothes, couldn't try on hats. Yeah. Um, there was roses. We could go to roses, but there was a separate counter. It was a one long counter, long counter, mm -hmm. but there was a partition between. We sat on the right. And the white customers sat on the left at the lunch counter. At the lunch counter, and we could do that. We could go to Roses, and, and the same thing at Woolworths, where Branch Bank is now. There was Woolworths, and we could go to Woolworths and do the same thing: sit on one side, white sit on the other side. Yeah. Um, we walked to school. Yeah, where'd you go to school? I went to Sam mm -hmm. It's OIC, yeah, OIC now, yeah. but it was Sam Big. Uh, technically speaking, and the way the lines were drawn at the time, I was supposed to be going to Elvis Street School. Yeah. But my mom did not like the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, really. uh, no, and she thought it was a little rowdy, and she just could not imagine her little girls walking around the corner. I, I never thought it was a bad place. You know, as a matter of fact, I live in that neighborhood now. Yeah. Uh huh. But um, she just didn't think it was a safe place for little girls to walk to school, so she took her chances with Sam Vic. Because on the way to Sam Vic, we would pass a couple of houses with people that she knew. You know, if she felt uneasy, she would say, well, the girls on the way to school, we would, you know, keep an eye out on them, watch out on them. Yeah. But uh, we would do that. Did you like school? I loved it. English was my favorite. English. English and history were my two favorite subjects. I wasn't crazy about math, but I made it through. I enjoyed history as I got into high school. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed history. But I, I went to Sam Vic. And by the time I got ready to go to middle school, uh, integration had come into play. Uh, you weren't assigned a school at that time. You could pick 
or choose whether you want to go to Charles L. Kuhn right. or Darn Vick. My eighth grade year, I went to Darn Vick, uh -huh. or Darn High, as it was called then. Yeah. My ninth grade year, I switched to Charles L. Kuhn. And at the time, Charles L. Kuhn was, was right down the street from Wood. There were two schools, two little schools. You went to Charles L. Kuhn the first half of the year, and then you switch over and walk down to Wood the second half of the year. I never understood the reasoning for that either. <laughs> because yeah. the courses were the same. It was part of North, of, you know, all across North Carolina there were these bizarre schemes to comply with Brown v. Board that didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. To comply with the letter of the law and yet still preserve some sort mm -hmm. of, as they would have said, our Southern way of right, our Southern way of segregation. We, right. We, we, we were still, like you said, we were, they were still sticking to the law just barely even by, you know, well, we're going to do it this way, and we're not against the law, we're going to do it this way. But that's the way they did. Um, as a matter of fact, there was a separate school system. There was the Wilson City School System, which I was a part of. There was the Wilson County School System, and there was Elm City. They had their school system. And uh, everybody did something different. Everybody, the, the courses were not the same. The equipment, Lord knows, was not the same. <laughs> Um, you knew that. Yes, mm -hmm. knew it when we came in. You know, we, we got used books, um, used science equipment, um, used football uniforms, basketball uniforms. You know, they were just handed down from the, the other schools. But um, on the whole, it was nice. But your teachers, the teachers were committed. Right, and they they, despite what they had to work with. Education was important because yeah. we were always taught that if the one thing that nobody, white, black, yellow, green, could steal from you was your mind. Who taught you that? G.K. Butterfield's mom, um, Savannah Farmer, uh -huh. Catherine Taylor, yeah. <laughs> uh, Atheline Emery. Some of my teachers are still they're still alive. Josephine Edwards. Some don't. Some have passed. But those were the things that they instilled in us. And then our parents, they knew that that was our only way out. If we were to succeed or if we were to become anything, we had to have an education. Uh, I mean, high school back then was very important. College was extremely important. You were considered a top dog if you were able to go to college. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you finished high school, you were still considered a top dog, you know, because that, that was the thing. Uh, when you went to school, you went to school that morning, unless you were at death's door, you got up and you went to school. You learned, you didn't go to school to play, because if you did, your teacher would let your mom know. She played all day. Um, and mom would say, okay, first thing you did when you got home from school, there was no snack, no rest time, no, uh, I'm going to watch TV for five or ten minutes and then I'm going to do my homework. You came home, you pulled off your school clothes, Maybe you grabbed a few cookies and some milk, and you immediately started to do your homework. Mm -hmm. You didn't even get done until your homework was done. Yeah. You didn't do anything until that homework was done. She would, parents would check the homework. You didn't come home and say, well, I did my work at school, okay? Well, you did it at school. You go back to school and get it so I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> if you did it at school. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so right. that, that was just not the excuse. Those were two things mm -hmm. you were required to do to go to school and learn and to go to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Those were the two main stages. You didn't, if you couldn't do those two things, you couldn't do anything else. Right. You couldn't go anywhere. So, you couldn't have any friends. Yeah. You couldn't do anything. So what you described with that, uh, I heard one person call it the Black Mecca downtown yes. business section. So it was. So, similar, someone said, to the Haytai area. Of it was. Um, with, with the, and, and so there was, Business driving business, right? The, uh, and that kind of excitement. Mm -hmm. A boutique, um, like I said, a week around the boutique. Uh, there was the places you can go and eat at. Yeah. Um, Rosa, Rosa's Cafe. She was one of the few black women that catered mm -hmm. at the time. She she had a catering business. Um, so there what's, was, what's happened to that? The catering business or the, or the mecca? To the downtown. Uh, well, I would say, I wouldn't say integration. I would just say. I would say generational thing. To me, as we got older and as we got more 
advanced and more cultured and a little bit more economically sound, uh, downtown wasn't the place to be anymore. Uh, and especially when integration came and we were able to go across the tracks and buy better goods, we, were, we had pretty good jobs, we had a little bit more spending money, so I could afford to go to J.C. Penney's and, and buy that dress instead of going across the boutique in here because that was a status symbol also. I got my dress from J.C. Penney's. You know, I got my shoes from um, the shoe place there, Brown's Shoe Place. I got my hat from Roses and, and that was a status thing. That, and as, as we got more into being economically sound and economically independent, that, that mecca began to fade. That plus the fact that some of the owners were getting older and their, kid, their children no longer had a desire to continue the business. Uh, I, I say maybe the funeral home business, that was the exception. There was the exception. The funeral home business, because we were right there at uh, Darden's funeral home, which is now Caron's, uh, Hamilton's funeral home, which was around the corner, Edward's funeral home. And uh, those, those, they carried on, the children carried on those businesses, but as far as the pool room was going on, and uh, the, the Bugarama, Artisan's Barbershop continued a long time. Mr. Williams, he had a barbershop on the other corner, but as, as their kids went off to college and came back home with degrees, uh, they didn't want to get into the business. They didn't want to run a barbershop, they wanted something a little bit more substantial, a little bit more status-like. Yeah. Uh, and as that progressed, Eventually, they became the nightclub area. They had the Needle's Eye. Uh, that was a little, I would say, it wouldn't be a little cafe, but you can go in and get a cold beer and sit down and, you know, talk to your friends and socialize. There was Diddy Pap's place, which was on the opposite spectrum, where you can go in, and if you went in at your own risk, because there was only one way in and one way out, and if they decided they wanted to start fighting, you grab a beer and you grab a corner. Because <laughs> if you were in the midst and you didn't, if you weren't by the front door or you weren't by the back door, shame on you. Uh -huh. you, you, you either had to stay and watch, uh, or, or you know, or, or you know, watch the fight, and 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 then even at that, guns were not the norm. Did police come? They there were police patrolling the area. There were black policemen, Doug, Douglas oh. Parks, Hank Williams, Rudolph Bass, but they were foot foot policemen. Mm -hmm. Uh, occasionally one would come on the car if it got out of hand, maybe two or three, you know, when they started throwing barrels and bottles and things of that nature, uh, they they would come and, you know, arrest them. But that, that, that's what the area eventually became. The pool rooms became hubs after Mrs. Zachary died. Uh, whoever got that pool room after he died, anybody could come in there. Ladies, dogs, cats, anybody who wanted to come in there. And that became another type of mecca, like I said, a nightclub area. It was a 20 grand on the corner by the railroad track, but that was the sophisticated club. You had to be dressed to get in. You couldn't go in with tennis shoes and sneakers. You had to have a nice shirt, nice tie. Ladies, you couldn't go in with splits, thigh high. You had to dress appropriately. But like I said, there were the little joints where they sold bootleg liquor. <laughs> uh -huh. mm -hmm. the, little, the little needles eye. Uh, Navarro artist. He he had the uh, he was an artist and he had a lot of drawings in his little joint. But during the weekdays, it was quiet as a mouse. So starting Friday night until. Early Sunday morning, because Sunday by that time everybody got a hangover, but they knew they better be in church Sunday morning, hungover or not. So by I said by two o'clock Saturday morning, everything had closed down. Uh, Those who could walk home, walk home. Those who stayed at home, stayed at home. Yeah. But you were sitting right there at that church Sunday morning. Uh -huh. uh, we used to keep bags of peppermint in the back of the church because you could smell the alcohol on the people's breath. And so when they were coming in in the morning, you know, they would pick up a little piece of candy. And just, you could hear them put it in your mouth before they even said hello or how are you. They would put that candy in their mouth and you could tell, you know, who had been out all night and who hadn't been out all night. But but I, I guess that's... They had peppermint. Right. Yeah, but that, yeah, I guess that was it still. I, I, me included, because by the time I got 20, uh, I, I, had, I hung out. My mom worked at the hospital. Yeah. And um, there was this little place called Jersey. 
Mercy Hospital. That's where she worked. She was a cook. Uh huh. She worked at Mercy Hospital, and then when they closed Mercy and opened up Wilson Memorial, she went to Wilson Memorial, where Miss Well made now. But there was this joint and Joe Johnson, my, and we were strictly told we stayed across the street. Don't go there. And we, we would say, well, why can't we go? We right there. All we gotta do is just cross over, and if anything happens, we can run them back, you know, across the street. Nothing's gonna happen. And she would say, don't do that. Don't go there. And and my sisters and I, we we were just dying to get there. And so one one day we just got married. And we walked over there that Friday after she'd gone to work because she was doing shift work. Mm -hmm. She would come home maybe one o'clock and go back, and she'd get off maybe eight or nine at night. Dad was in and out doing his thing, and so we would run over. And we, we went one night, and we were just dancing, having the grandest time. Yeah. Didn't think about anything. It was yeah. a couple of guys that we liked, and yeah. we were just having a grand ball. And all of a sudden, you know, we were just backing up, doing a little slide thing. Mm -hmm. So look back and you know who's behind me? Uh -oh. My mom. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh no. She grabbed me by my collar. She grabbed me. Yeah. And she grabbed my sister by her hand. And she politely escorted us across the street. And said, uh, she didn't even ask what we were doing. She just said, girls, go to bed. Good night. And we stayed woke all night. <laughs> One day. When is she gonna come and, and give us a spanking or give us a talking to? Yeah. She for two whole days she she, she had like uh -huh. that. And two whole days we all sleep. We could not sleep. We all we and, and we had to get up and go to church that Sunday morning and you wouldn't dare go to sleep in church that Sunday morning. Uh -huh. And she would sit back and look at us and see who would mind and we keeping our heads up. So she, she waited a week before she finally got us. And, and she we, did. Yeah, she grounded us for a week. Mm -hmm. She let you think about it. Oh, but but, but we, we thought we were going to get something else drastic. We were looking for a nice switching. Because yeah. my mom was the type that believed in switching. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I do believe you can discipline a child with a spanking. Because I was spanked a lot. We had, she, but she had the braided switches. That was normal. She kept a braided switch in each room in that house. And she would, you know, if you got out of the line. And I, I, we weren't abused. We never had marks. We understood, you know, it was yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir. You didn't disrespect your parents. You know, if they told you something, they didn't have to repeat it. If I told you the first time, you, you did it. You didn't wait. And you didn't say, well, why Why I got to do it now? Or can I do it later? Yeah. No such thing. No. Uh-uh. You didn't. That was just not the norm. But there were, like I said, after the businesses died down, it became a nightclub. And then in the early 70s, right about the time I started to graduate from high school, it became the drug capital of the world. Yeah. You can go and buy all the, all the drugs you want. And at the time, uh, heroin was not popular. It was marijuana yeah. and the pills, the Red Devils, the Speed, because uh, there, there were a lot of soldiers, a lot of guys that had graduated from Darden had gone to Vietnam and had come back with hats. Right. And that was the place to come and get whatever you need for your hat. Yeah. Like I said, heroin was not the popular drug. Crack had never been heard of. Right. Uh, you could buy all the marijuana you wanted. You could buy all the pills you wanted. Bootleg liquor was still the drug of choice, though. You know, people would, would buy it from the ABC store, and they would get a little house or a little shot glasses, and you could buy a little shot of liquor for fifty cents. Or, you know, uh, they would go to the store and buy beer by a case. You can get a case maybe six dollars, and they you go to the bootleg house and buy that same beer that you can get now for a dollar seventy five. They would sell you that same can of beer for three dollars to make a profit. And that's that's what he eventually became a drug infested place. Yeah. Uh, guns became the norm when I was growing up. Uh, two guys got in a fight. They would tough it out. Uh, the worst thing that would happen was one of them would get cut. That would be it. If they got cut, they went to the hospital. And and the ambulance did not pick African Americans up. Right. The hearse, because my dad worked at Hamilton part time. So the hearse would come, if you, if I got cut in a fight downtown, the hearse would come and take me to Mercy Hospital. I couldn't ride in the ambulance. I had to ride in a hearse. A hearse from Hamilton or a hearse from Edwards. 
that's that's the only way I that would, unless the person had a car, that would be my transportation to the hospital. But they would fight. Somebody might occasionally get cut, but most of the time they fought it out like Muhammad Ali with their fists. They would fight it out. Uh, if you got beat, you you took your beating like a man or a woman, because the women were just as bad. I mean, they would they would tough it out, fight it out too. No hair pulling like they do now, pulling out your weave and pulling off your wig. I mean, they would get out with their fists and fight just as hard as, as guys. But once the fight was over, it was it. There was no re retaliation. Uh, you went your way, and they went their way. You didn't hear about it two or three days later. They didn't come back with their entourage and try to settle the score. Right. It was just over. But That's like I said, right. in, the, in the 70s, as the 70s progressed, it, it, it got worse. You know, it's, it's not like, I'm not going to fight you anymore. I'm too good to fight. I'll just shoot you and get you out of the way. I'll just go ahead and get my gun and blow you on the way and, yeah. and be done with it. Yeah. You said that, that those changes you mentioned, um, that it was somehow related to integration. We mm -hmm. know it's about that same time. About that same time. And it had to do with people having the opportunity. The doors were open. The doors were open. Mm -hmm. and so, but something was lost. You, you talked about these networks that um, where Mama found out what was going on in school. If you got in trouble at school, your mom found out about it. Mm -hmm. and but, probably your preacher too. Yes, oh yes, because we live down the street. I, I, I can walk to you, you, you didn't. You didn't like that as a child sometimes, but I imagine you, you probably felt a part of a community. Right, and that somebody cared. Somebody cared. And, and, and as I say, I, integration didn't play a part in it because we became and it, it, we were saying we began to segregate ourselves, put it that way. Mm -hmm. As I said, we, we, we were the doors were open now. We were making more money. Uh, we had better jobs. We were able to go across on West Nash and buy the things we couldn't buy. And depending on your status, if you were a teacher, a doctor, uh -huh. uh, African American lawyer, uh -huh. a teacher, Congressman Butterfield's folks, his dad. Um, the, the teachers, the, the Bradfords, um, the artists, the farmers, if you taught school, uh, you were considered high class. To and these folks moved across the track? They moved, they, they, they moved across the state. They lived in the neighborhood. Uh -huh. they, they, they attended the same churches. The class, divided. class, class, class. Did division. that seem to grow? Mm -hmm. after? It seemed to grow. Along with the segregation, I mean, like I said, after the doors of segregation, you know, we were able to move about freely without any restraints. That's when the, it seemed to become a class issue. And the class all of a sudden, by group. Um, by group, all of a sudden, if my mom, my mom, like I said, she worked in the hospital, and my grandmother and my great mother, they were domestics, so we were kind of in between. Um, if your, your mom taught school, she was a doctor or a nurse, you were the higher class. My, my group, we were middle class. And if your mom or dad worked in the factories, the tobacco factories, which was a mainstay when I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. If your mom worked in the factory or did custodial work or anything they considered demeaning at the time, then you were considered a, a lower class. You, you, you were looked down upon, even though they were concerned and they cared about you. And if you got out of line, regardless of what class you were, if they saw you, they, they didn't have any problem telling your parent, you know, when well, your child did, you know, they would tell it. The tone may not be the same, yeah. but your child did this and your child did that. And they, they would let the parent know she was out of line, you know, she, or she was out of line. And there were um, things, even in our own culture, that we just you know, when they had the um, sweetheart balls or the um, sorority affairs. Some were invited, some were not, depending on what, what status your mom or dad had. Uh, if your mom taught school and, and you, uh, same thing with high school, when we got to start high school. Uh, if your mom or dad, African American, was a teacher or a lawyer, your chances were great at becoming a cheerleader or a coach or co-captain of some, some team or something of that nature. But if not, you know, if you didn't have it academically too, yeah. uh, you, you, were, you were out of the, out of the loop. Yeah. 
Yeah. Out of the but that that caused part of the decay. And then, it, like I said, it was a gen generational thing. As out as my bunch went off to college, went off to, to technical school, and we, we some of us had a desire to come back and want to start back where we started from. Some, you know, as you know, moved up north or moved away and had no desire to come back. And therefore, those who came back, came back to something entirely different. When I got back from school, um, the neighborhood was no longer the same. Some of the buildings have been torn down. Uh, some of them have been boarded up. And like I said, it was extremely drug infested. So about what year are we talking about? Uh, 71, I said 71, 75. That, 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 that time period. Um, and then when we came back, we were a new generation, so to speak, too. We had gotten bolder. We had gotten wiser. We were more educated. We thought our parents had done a great job doing what they'd done. But now, we were smarter than Mama and Daddy. And we knew more than Mama and Daddy. And we were making more money than Mama and Daddy. Therefore, uh, yeah, Mom, I appreciate your advice. But that was then. This is now. <laughs> uh, times have changed. I'm not that same child. The neighborhood has changed. The world has changed. Uh, we don't do things. My generation doesn't do things like that anymore. We, we wouldn't dare do that. Uh, we wouldn't dare walk up to somebody and, and say, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Not anymore. It was yes or no. No longer yes, ma'am. You no, know, yes, sir. It was either yes or no. Because um, we had gotten, we had arrived, we thought, we were it. We had, you know, we didn't need to do what you guys did. We were more educated, so we knew, you know, yeah, we knew segregation existed, but we knew how to get around it, so we thought. So there's that class, growing class divide. Right, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and then segregation was coming in different forms. When I was a child, it was nothing to see a clan rally. You saw Clay and Rattles right. here? Mm -hmm. Where did they rally? At the courthouse. They would have speeches oh, with the little sheets. And, and, and you know, we weren't allowed. We would look, but that's all we would do. Did you hear we what they were saying? D down, you know, niggas go home. We're not going to integrate. Uh, we like things the way they are. You know, you stay on your side, we stay on our side. But by the time I came along, uh, racism was in a double form. It was in an economic form. Uh, it was in a healthcare form, as it is some today. Uh, it was in an educational form. Racism, racism, that's when you got uh, special ed classes or classes for the slow learner or that's when you got um, to work. I, I can be a supervisor, but I couldn't be head supervisor. You know, I, you, I, you can work under me or health-wise. Um, you could see this doctor or that doctor for whatever illness you have, but you know you can't see this specialist unless it's recommended. And, and it, like I said, that that was the, the norm then. We had gotten to that point, and, and we we seem to tend to say, okay, it didn't exist, and it did exist. It was just not as outright as it was when I was a child. Right. When I was a child, I knew who the Klan was. I knew what the Klan looked like. I knew what they sounded like. As I got older, as I went off to school and I came back home, I didn't know because I could be working. My boss could be just as nice as he could be. Wonderful, excellent boss, but still, he could be a clan man for what I knew. Didn't know. That's a, that's kind of a symbolic for what happened you know, with our with our attitudes about race. Mm -hmm. It used to be right out there with the what you we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I often wonder now, you know, we back then we could hold a rally and say the signs must come down and march and chant the signs come down and go, yay, we won. Mm -hmm. It's not now. But, it's, yeah, it's not out there. It's not out front. Wilson, I've been here three years. Wilson, to me, uh, is well, still the, probably the most segregated town I've ever been in. And did you realize that the most segregated hour is between 10 and 12 on Sunday morning? Right, I know that. I'm doing my part. <laughs> the okay. most segregated I've hour. I've been to Jackson Chapel, but I went to St. John for a year. Mm -hmm. But 
Yeah, my wife and I were the only white folks. Mm -hmm. It's the most segregated time of the year. Yeah. Segregated, but That's but true. It, it, it's it's the it, town it, itself. You know, it when is. you cross those tracks, mm -hmm. you know you're entering a different world, in di different territory. Yeah. Even with even with the the election of a black sheriff and a yeah. Yeah. black police officer, mm -hmm. and at one point we used to have a black fire chief. Um, but the way but people live. Live, right. And it, you know, and my neighborhood is um, fairly integrated. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yet, you it's drive concerned. over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. We don't, I mean, I know a couple of people from work, so we, we don't talk to any of our neighbors anymore. Neighborhoods aren't what they used to be. But anyway, my point is that still the railroad tracks mark us strong. You don't see a lot of white folks moving over here. Mm -mm. No. And so this is a, we, this is still a segregated town. Even among us, there are certain neighborhoods that we like to go in. Where I live. So that's the class. That's thing. the class thing. Yeah. But it's it's still it's still a part of us. It's it's part of that racism thing too. It's yeah. still part of even even though they won't they, it won't they it's won't come out and say it. Right. It's still racism. I, I live over here, and so I'm not going to come visit you because where I live, right down this Penn Street, I mean, it, it used to be a little hub, a little gangster area uh, after they closed up. There used to be um, O'Neill's Chicken Yard used to be there, and uh, they had a chicken processing plant. Mm -hmm. There are some apartments there now, but uh, that area, it, it, there, I mean, it was just alcohol infested. Not a lot of drugs, but more, you, you, there was a, a time when you couldn't go in that neighborhood where you didn't see somebody laying there sprawled out, you know. And and so you were not allowed to go into that neighborhood unless you meet your parent or you were riding on a car or you were going through to, to get to a better part of the city. Right. <laughs> right. You were not allowed to go in that neighborhood. But even, even, like I said, even when we cross the tracks now, yeah. you know, um, so there's so you talking about segregation within the black community. Mm -hmm. within, our, within ourselves, yeah. And, and it still, it does exist to a point, like you said, uh, that, that segregation time uh, with our churches. I, I, I believe if we, as churches, could get together and, and, and do things without saying, well, I'm Baptist, you're Jewish, you're uh, holiness, your apostolic this, and, and I know everybody's got their belief in their denomination, but I do believe in my heart of hearts, if we could put that aside and work for the common good, that some of this stuff could be done away with. Just like now, we're, we're having vacation Bible school with uh, Calvary Presbyterian Church, mm -hmm. and this is the first year that we've ever done a joint vacation Bible school. Mm -hmm. How's that going? It's going great. Wonderful. I, I've never been so happy in my life, and I wish that other churches would do the same. Because we're, we're in church alley, and you know that. Okay. And three here, when you come back, if you go down Penn Street from me, there are three more. Right in, right there's one on the corner before you get to my house, one facing me diagonally, and two, two doors down, there's another church. So all this block is church alley, that's what you call. And if those churches, Wilson Chapel could get together and do something jointly, you know. And, and I'm not saying that it, it it wouldn't be a work in progress because everybody's got their own thing. But I really believe if we could come together as churches, even on you know even on the other side of the track, uh, they have a chew program. We're working with the chew program, and and that's great. But there are other things that as a church. Well, which church is the chew program? Uh, Jackson Chapel is working with it. Um, Farmington Heights is working with it. It's First Baptist, First Baptist. All right. I think they're working with the chief program. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, and that's a feeding? Feeding program, right. For, for There are some children that have been, uh, I would say, there are children that, that are considered not getting healthy, nutritious foods. Right. They provide food for them during the weekends, you know, when they're not in school because you know in school you know they're going to get breakfast and they're going to get lunch some get dinner but on the weekends you don't know whether they get that meal or not 
So the CHU program provides uh, backpacks with perishable goods, stuff they can put in the microwave to eat for the weekend until they're able to go back to school. Now that the school is got out, they'll do it on a weekly basis. And we did, I'm not sure we still do, but we did have a summer feeding program where the children can go to the Penn Street Recreation Center, um, Elvis Street, Daniels Elementary School, or Daniels School, and it was Reed Street, if I'm not mistaken, and they can get lunch free. They, they could go during the summer. That was their, their feeding program. They, they've had it a couple of years. Um, I hadn't heard anybody mention it, whether they got it going this year or not. Um, but their school's out, you know, and they, children, they're not, they're not getting anything, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And the CHU program provides something for them to, to, to eat, to, to stay nutritious. And that, that program started out with Maddie Brown. I, I, know, I don't know whether you knew her or not. Um, she had spotted some children going in a garbage can looking for something to eat. And uh, they hadn't had anything, and she started a, a soup kitchen across the tracks. And she started a soup kitchen, and people were donating food for her to feed the children, and it got larger, and she started to feed the, the, home, the men and women who weren't able to get anything. But it was her soup kitchen that got all these other, St. Teresa already had one. They had a soup kitchen already established, but those things. So when you're at the, when you're uh, doing that work at you, so you're interacting with people from the white church, right? So is there really much interaction that goes on? While we're packing the bags and laughing talk. and joking and talking, oh, yeah, that's 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 the interaction. But but once we get those delivered, uh, I may not see you anymore until we get ready to pack the next bag. Or if we have an, uh, a workshop, or if somebody wants to come and give us a lecture, as, as far as socializing, is uh, sometimes it's non-existent to put it that way, and, and 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 that's something you know that that that's we need to do too. It's something we need to do too. I need to know what you like. I mean, you know, I can't look at you and say, you know, you like this type of music and. I like that kind. We need, we need to know more about each other. And if we sit down and really sit down and talk to each other, we will find out that we have more things in common mm -hmm. than we do. Yeah, if we share, we have to share our lives. That's right. what we have to do. We have a lot. And we would find those things in common. Mm -hmm. A lot of things. But we'd also find some differences that are pretty intriguing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, can you imagine what. Uh, what mainline music would have been without the blues, for oh, example. Yes. If but we didn't, and of course that was white people. Mm -hmm. and but see, and Buddy Holly took that tradition. But, I, but now, but, but can you? Can I, can, I, can, I can't imagine. But now, <laughs> me for example, and, and, and my, my sister and my children's father used to get on me all the time because I like classical music. I am a Bach. Bronze Beethoven fan. And they get on me. I, I, they get on me. Why do you like that kind of music? I mean, don't get me wrong. I like the Temptations. I like the Supremes. Yeah. I like, but I, I, but I like country and western. Yeah. Not all. Yeah. I, but now rap is just not my thing. Yeah. Never has been. I, I mean, there are some forms. You know, the positive kind. You know, that they encourage you to stay in school, respect your parents, and do all this kind of stuff. But all this other stuff with the with the, the A word and the B word. It's just not for me, yeah. and, and, and I never liked it, never, probably never will. My daughters, I have two twin daughters, 27 years old, and when, when they come to the house, if I get in the car, if that's what they're playing, they I can just look, and they know my mom don't like that. <laughs> but then they, they like that kind of music because that's what they were exposed to as children because I had twins, and Lord knows, when I couldn't get them to sleep, I would put on Beethoven, and they'd be gone, oh, six yeah. or seven. Where did you get, where did you, uh... My, mom, my grandmother worked for Dr. William C. Hunt. Uh -huh. And some days I would go with her to work. And he was a Beethoven fan. He would always come home. He was a doctor. He would come home in the afternoons if my grandma was working in. You know, sometimes I got to go with her. Yeah. And he would always go into his study and put on something by Beethoven. And he'd sit there with his National Geographic. And he'd read it. You know, I guess it would calm him down or his release. And it, it was just 
something I, 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 you know, I listened to. Right. And I, I, it was soothing, it was calming. So yeah. I, I listened to it. I, I like exotic am I like snakes. Yeah, I think you, by the way, do you, do you play any instruments? No, I sing a little, but, you sing. Mm -hmm, but don't know instruments. But now, I, I, I had a thing for I, snakes. snakes. I, I, snake, we, I had a pet snake. <laughs> I had a pet iguana. Uh, they, people say, well, what is wrong with her? But now I am definitely afraid of worms. <laughs> definitely afraid of worms. Mouth. Mo uh, I, 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 worms just just do something to me. Yeah. But now snakes, I have no problems with. But but and, and when when we get together and we start talking, if I can get with some of my girlfriends and we start talking, and they say, well, I like this kind of music. Uh, I like Marvin Gaye or I like Temptations. And I say, you know, I like them too. But when you listen to them, um, Beethoven's fear. Yeah. Or Beethoven's mind. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you, why? I said, it's not like, I, I just like it. Yes, there's some of the stuff. Yeah. And then a lot of it's, it's exposure too. You know, yeah, yeah. that's what I was exposed to. Because my grandmother and my great grandmother were domestics and they worked in these homes that had these yeah. things, they had books. Yeah. But, it's just, but you know, we have so many stereotypes.